Wagwan, how you there? What's good? And you know who this is, baby. The number one podcast in America dedicated to all you kings and queens of color, homies and homets, shatters, woo gals, G boys, and charges. The one and only Jerk Jalop and Collard Greens Podcast. Wagwan, are you there? What's good? It's your host and humble extrovert, G. And today's episode is a sliver of postseason bonus content, an episode I like to call The Jerk Tank. And no, I'm not talking circle jerks or other sadistic forms of male masturbation. We are giving you the nitty gritty one-on-ones with the latest and greatest in business and entrepreneurship starred by yours truly. Because let's be real, we don't have that copyright infringement money. We don't have that Kevin O'Leary money. We don't have that Mark Cuban money. And Beta Tank just, just doesn't sound right. But enough of that. On to our guest for the first ever feature on The Jerk Tank. We have CEO and owner of what's looking to be the Uber of laundry. And also a very good friend of the pod, Mr. Daniel Ellis of Aloha Laundry Life. And today, we're giving you the 411 on his latest entry to the gig economy. How you can get involved early and a little prospectus on the gig economy as a whole and what it takes to get started in this space. So tune in right now for your daily dose of culture and more right after we pay this tribute. And if you aren't already a follower, definitely plug in and tune into us on Instagram at Jerk Jalof Collard Pod and show us some love today because that's all we're doing out here right now in this world where it's tumultuous and it's scary to go outside. We're giving y'all some love. But enough of that. On to our guest today, Mr. Daniel Ellis, very, very, very good friend of mine here, doing his thing in the gig space. Ellis, go ahead and say hello. You know, if I had a sound bank, I'd give you a round of applause right now, but this is the Diary of the Struggle cast, so I'm just going to clap. That works, man. (laughs) Appreciate it, Glenn. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, man, it's been a minute, so uh, glad to reconnect and kind of... um, show you guys what aloha is all about but um yeah excellent to be a part of the podcast i've been listening to you guys for a while since you guys started um had a chance to listen to a couple episodes so it's pretty cool man i appreciate it appreciate it man we definitely love when listeners become you know participants and it just gives more breath into what we do you know this gives it more life so for the people before we get into it can you just drop them your handles real quick how to follow you um where to find you on social media yeah, so I, I keep it simple. Uh, mm. If you go to Instagram or uh, Facebook, it's at Aloha Laundry Life app and uh, simple as that. All right. That's what's up. We like simple because I think, honestly, there's just way too many apps, in my opinion. We have one serious question for you right now before we get into what Aloha is about and how you got started in the gig space. And this is going to tell the people a lot about you. What I like to call one's got to go. And your options are macaroni pie. Candy yams or fried plantains. One's got to go. So when you say one's got to go, it means you, you get the other two? You get the other two. Oh, man. So I'm going to have to say the candy yams got to go and I'll keep the other two then. Candy yams. You're out. Tough that choice, but. Jamaica and Nigeria are on the map. There you go. He said it. Just a jerk Joel off a podcast at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but no doubt so d tell us where are you from man where are you currently based out of a little bit about your background as well so the people know excellent yeah man i think like a lot of people covid and just kind of the pandemic or whatever you might want to call it has caused us to shift and kind of move different places and relocate Mm. where that might be i grew up mostly in michigan like metro detroit area i moved to cincinnati for a little while and then right now I'm actually living in Texas, like the bottom of Texas by the border. It's called Brownsville. But uh, originally I was born in Ethiopia. Oh, wow. Okay. So straight from the motherland and you moved Midwest, to mid- to Detroit, like you've been all over pretty much like yeah. all of the hot spots. But that's what's up. All right. Yeah. That's what's good. And like, can you tell us a little bit about your professional background and before you got into the gig? For sure. So I won't go too far back, but basically after I graduated college, I worked at Toyota about five years. I worked in their purchasing department for a little while and their supply diversity department for a little bit. And then I worked in their 
like their systems and IT department for about a year or so. Basically said, hey, I'm about to turn 30. I either you know, going to become an entrepreneur or I'm not. So let's figure this out. So uh, I quit kind of out of the blue. I said, hey, I'm going to go try to be an entrepreneur, try to survive. So then I started a small consulting company where I was kind of just doing a little bit of consulting here and there. And then I ended up moving to Panama where I was able to do some consulting work there. Uh, but mm -hmm. then COVID came in and stepped into my plans and kind of diverted what I was trying to do. So I ended up having to come back to the U.S. in uh, March of 2020. So I had to reignite some kind of career or some kind of uh, income. And uh, I was trying to buy a business. I was trying to you know, start uh, another consultant company or try to get uh, companies who were willing to work with me. But as you know, like everybody was kind of laying off people or figuring out ways not to uh, exactly. hire more people. So I ended up just trying to find a business to buy. And that's how I ended up with uh, Aloha Laundry Life, started working with them, ended up being a consultant for them, and then eventually developed into the CTO and then eventually became the CEO. Wow. But I definitely feel you for sticking it to the man and really trying to do it on your own. Like, that's a sentiment that I also share. I kind of feel like at this point, you know, once you hit a certain age, it's kind of like, yo, am I going to remain in this tax bracket where I'm paying the most when you could be doing something like starting a business? And granted, it may not be for everyone. And that's what some people may learn today as well. Like, you kind of get this grandiose view of, yeah, start your own business and, you know, you'll be fine and your career will be jump started. But you know, it's a little bit more to it than that. And as you can hear from your tale as well, even leaving the States and coming back at some point, you know, just got to definitely admire like the passion and kind of just like the the wherewithal to, and the perseverance to stick with it. Because I know most people would have just given up and say, you know what, let me just go back to my job and just settle with the security. But yeah, I definitely, definitely, definitely feel that. So when you said you were looking for a business to buy, what specifically got you into laundry? I kind of got to the point where, um, you know, you could see a lot of franchises you can you can buy. There's a, a lot of like small business that you could purchase and take over and try to do owner financing or proper financing to get it going. But uh, just a learning curve, you just didn't know what you're getting into. Um, mm. So I just kind of felt like laundry was a, a pretty simple business. I thought I could handle it and just say, hey, you know, based on what I know, of you know how to run a small business or how to operate a small business um you know laundromats are relatively simple and pretty straightforward um and then when i found out about aloha laundry life and i said hey this is laundry simple but technology on top of it i was like hey this might be the right fit for me yeah definitely yeah. and you, you kind of tapped into two things as well when it comes to buying a business i think you mentioned the um, owner finance, and I guess it's buying it outright. Could you go into a little bit about what that means as well for people that are interested? So if you don't know, there are sites where you can legit buy a business that's functioning and running. Basically, you become the owner of that business. And I think one of the two ways you can do that is, you know, try to finance through the seller. I could say you don't have all the money to pay it down. You can pay that person in installments and run the business right then and there, right? Exactly. Yeah. It's just, gotcha. you know, if it's a legit business and it's operationally sound and they're, you know, they're making a decent profit, most of the times if an owner is on a, in a hard bind or just trying to get out for what, whatever reason, you should be able to negotiate some kind of seller financing and say, hey, you know what, you don't want to do this business anymore for whatever that reason might be. I'll take over the business for you. But instead of me, you know, borrowing money from the bank and paying interest, uh, et cetera, let's negotiate, let's finance through you. And then each month or each quarter, however you want, might want to set it up, you pay back that owner and then you eventually take over the business. That's a that's a good deal. Because let's be real, like laundry is kind of like one of those businesses that it is not sexy. You know what I mean? It's not sultry. It's not something that you see out there. And that's what I like to call quiet money, because it's something that everyone uses but no one's really willing to take advantage of. You can see that there's a certain demographic that kind of runs that space in a certain extent, especially when I look within my own community, it's very evident like, hey, there aren't a lot of black launderers, you know what I mean? Or black owned laundry businesses. There are these industries out there that you can make money with, you know, hand over fist regularly because these are basic needs and necessities that people go after. And mm -hmm. honestly, that's what, those are the avenues people really need to start looking at. All right. So into the laundry aspect, you settled on buying a business. 
you know, could you kind of tell us what that was like, how like were any like issues or struggles you went through in trying to, you know, make an offer for the business or anything like that? Yeah. So the thing about Aloha Laundry Life, that's a little bit different. You don't have to per se buy a business, but mm. you know, if I can kind of talk about like the struggles of buying a business, uh, just in the traditional sense, um, you know, your best bet, actually, in my opinion, if you want to buy a business is to walk up to a business, knock on their doors and say, Hey, how are you doing? What's going on in your business? Are you interested in selling? You yeah. do your due diligence, figure out what they're doing. That's your best bet, honestly, to, to find a, a solid <laughs> business. Because if you go on whatever website or you see a business for sale, already you can just kind of say, you know, they probably introduce it to their family, a best friend, another business person, a, you know, broker. So it's already went through like kind of a couple filtration process by the time it ends up on a website. Yeah. You know? So you're probably like third or fourth layer of, I don't want this business. No, I don't want this business. And then it shows up on a website <laughs> and then now you're looking at that business. So that was one of the biggest obstacles I faced kind of on those, you know, broker websites is realizing that, you know, no, they're not always the, the best business to buy and they're struggling or they have issues. Um, and you got to really come in there and be able to either learn really fast or have expertise in that business or have a really, really good relationship with that owner, you know, it's hit or miss. But from Aloha Launch Life perspective, the difference is it's more of a licensing model, which we allow, basically you can buy a territory or an area and whatever we do of laundry in that area, you make a percentage off that. Let's imagine when Uber or Instacart started, yeah. and you actually owned a state or a city or something of that sort. And every single time Uber or Instacart does a load of laundry in New York City, you get a small percentage of that order or in mm. Texas or in Austin. It's how we raise money and said, hey, let's sell licenses, let's sell areas so that those people who are visionaries and who really kind of see this you know, coming to reality before an app is built, before the technology is there, before the operations are there, uh, let's give them an opportunity to make money in the, in the long term. So we have a lot of people who are really building our vision and not just because we had a really good idea, they're like, hey, I thought of this idea too, but I just didn't know how to make the app where I didn't have access to, you know, 30 hours a week to kind of spend on developing this. Mm -hmm. So that we're able to do that kind of across the country and get things running. That, that. So I don't know if people heard that, but imagine if you were able, speaking to the public, to own a piece of Uber or Lyft, you know, at the time that they were starting. And these opportunities generally don't come to the, the common person usually kind of just go straight to VCs, venture capitalists, the big earners or investors, you know, where they can drop like a good 500, 600, even up towards a million, you know, for a share of the company. And what we're bringing to you right here with Aloha, the potential of getting involved from the ground up and earning essentially passive income on something that we typically do. You know, I've never seen a laundry for the most part go out of business unless it was poorly ran. Some of these wash and fold services now where people just typically don't have the time to do laundry. And now we're bringing a model that could potentially assist with that. Before we dial back into how your service actually works, can you tell us why the name Aloha Laundry Life? Yeah, so the Aloha Laundry Life kind of has a couple of components to it. One, uh, our original founder, uh, Peter Trang, actually is from Hawaii. Basically, he pitched the idea to a couple business partners and they said, hey, this seems like a great idea. Uh, but originally he was from there and then Aloha is kind of speaks to positivity, to love, to community. And, uh, that's kind of the atmosphere that we want to create when we deliver laundry. Um, and then ultimately, you know, when we greet our customers or we interact with our customers, every interaction is more of a greeting of a, um, Hey, we welcome you into our space, our, our time, and we appreciate the opportunity to do your laundry. This is not just a business transaction, right? Uh, um, we're not just randomly showing up at your door, taking you in your laundry, running off mm. and doing something crazy. It's, hey, this is your laundry. We're going to take care of it to the best of our ability. And that kind of speaks to the Aloha spirit. Like when you go to Hawaii or you know vacation spot, they treat you like absolutely. You know, premium service or royalty because they appreciate doing business with you. And that's kind of the customer service that we want to put front uh, with each of uh, each of our transactions with the customer. Yeah, because I could think like whenever I'm doing laundry, I don't feel like saying aloha. 
You know what I mean? I'd be like, this goddamn laundry. You know what I mean? Exactly. <laughs> we want to convert <laughs> that, you know? For yeah. real. Like, give me your goddamn laundry. <laughs> you already talked about one aspect, which is the licenses. Tell us a little bit about how the service works, I guess, from the laundry mats. Like, how do they get involved? How does the app work? I know there's an app, and then there's the laundry businesses, and then there's the drivers and the wash and fold. Break down the steps of how it works. Yeah, so just from like a holistic level, we have different components of the business. So like you said, we have the licensees who are basically the visionaries who said, I believe in your business. I want to own a territory or a state or an area, mm. right? And then you have the laundromats, which our vision for them is basically saying, you own a laundromat of brick and mortar today. Um, and most of the time, a laundromat is not that busy. You know, you have your peak hours and you have during the day when there's nobody at the laundromat, right? Yeah. Most people have to work or have jobs or, you know, so they show up on the weekends or in the evenings to do their laundry. Uh, so what we kind of pitch the laundromats and say is, hey, we can use your machines and get more turns out of those machines because we're giving you guys more orders. We're giving you more customers and we're bringing the wash and pull to your facility. Mm. Right. And then the uh, third component is the actual people who are doing the washing and folding, which we call market developers. Right. Yeah. So they pick up laundry from a customer, they take it to a laundromat, and then they either literally do the wash and fold themselves, or for whatever reason, if they're busy or they have too many orders, they actually drop it off the laundromat, let the laundromat do the wash and fold, and then they just focus on the pickup and delivery. So gotcha. our platform allows for all of that. And we have, you know, a customer app so that the customer can place an order. We have a merchant app which allows the the operator or the market developer to run the whole business from their phone. Gotcha. So you have the licensees, the market developers, and then you have the actual operators, which would be like the laundry mats. On uh, so let's say I'm interested in being a licensee, like I buy a region. So let's say I, like an example, would say maybe I bought Austin, Texas. You know that's that's potential. I could mm -hmm. be a licensee for the city of Austin. Basically, from that point on, what what I have to do to to get, start generating my passive income? Like what's the steps I would have to take as a licensee in the city of Austin? Yeah, so I think the key phrase is, is a passive income is this is a business opportunity for you. So uh, you as a, a licensee, you can buy the territory and option A is just you become passive. You just say, hey, whenever the app is fully operational, whenever there's order, I'll collect my check at each month and you know, I'll keep at that. If you become a little bit more active than just a regular passive master licensee, then you can help us get things rolling in your area. So if you say, hey, you know what, I'll I'll visit the laundromats near me. I'll help you guys recruit market developers to actually just start doing wash and fold. You can be involved in that process, but you don't need to be because we're going to expand to every city, no matter if you're involved or not. But yeah. if you want to kind of get things rolling a little bit quicker or you already have contacts or you say, hey, I just need my laundry done physically so just get somebody over here asap and you know we can definitely be involved in that process too you're not limited to the cities either you can buy like an entire state if you're interested as a yeah, you, licensee 100 percent. wow all right y'all hear that so you could buy a state and like what are the typical buy-in costs would you say like how much would i have to expect to put in as a licensee to get started yeah, so we we do it by population and kind of demographics um, and then different regions of the country are priced a little bit differently, but gotcha. the lowest value per, per population is 250,000 people. So you can use that as your floor and then above that, you can kind of build out whatever your area is and you can say, hey, I just want to build a county or a zip code. I want a, a city or you can do like a metropolitan area or you can do a whole state and then, you know, we, we do pricing based off that. That, that so it's the first you can break it down to multiple tiers okay that's what's up so essentially you can kind of work within any budget or if you were to come in as a team of licensees let's say if someone doesn't want to jump on it alone that would probably be ideal for them and that way they can kind of split that as well um and what as far as what they own and how much is put in so that's a prospect there so let's talk about the market developers now so you know i'm an uber driver i'm looking to add this to my list of gigs you know, what can I expect on a day-to-day -day as a market developer? How do I get started as a market developer? Yeah, so we're we're trying to kind of change the paradigm of like being a gig worker or being an Uber driver. You know, one thing, we're, I'm sure you're living in New York, so you know this probably better than anybody. You'll have 
an Uber driver, you'll make a request and they'll cancel on you or like reject your order Facts. because this is not worth their time. Like if it's a, a four dollar trip, they're gonna accept it, and then when they see a five dollar trip, they're gonna reject yours and like pass exactly. another one, right? Um, so we're trying to convert them and say, hey, you can be a gig worker, you can be a ten ninety nine employee or an independent contractor and still make a decent living and control you know, how much you make on a given week or a given month. And you don't have to just be labeled a, a gig worker or a driver. So what we allow our market developers to be is you can create a virtual laundromat and run your own small laundromat as if it was like a physical one, but everything is on app instead of a, a brick and mortar. Right. Gotcha, gotcha. So, you know, how does that actually operationally work is you join the platform. We show you how to do, um, a virtual laundromat. We even give you access to Laundry University where you can actually learn how to run a, a laundromat per se. And then we show you what service to offer in your location. We'll help you do the pricing for your specific location. And then we help you do a couple of test orders. Okay, this is how you actually use the, receive the order from the customer. This is how you show up at the customer. This is how you use the apps to make sure you, you, know, you communicate with the customer properly. And then from there, it's simple. You just do wash and fold, you know? Gotcha, gotcha. So this one will be a little bit more hands-on to where you're actually handling the laundry. I know that you had an aspect where you mentioned, all right, let's say I didn't want to necessarily handle the laundry. That could be passed on to the laundromat itself as well. Correct. Yeah. Uh, you know, different parts of the area or the, the country uh, wash and fold is priced differently. So you might find a laundromat that does really good wash and fold at a very competitive price. And you might say, hey, you know what? I'd rather just focus on the pickup and delivery. I can go ahead and generate um, more customers. I can go run around, pick up laundry. I'd rather focus on that and let the laundromat do the wash and fold. And that's 100% viable. We, uh, our platform supports that. Wow. So it basically, it's putting the ownership in the hands. And like I can see where this differs from your typical models, where basically your rate is already set and you get what you earn based on that rate. But here, you're actually, it seems like you're able to kind of negotiate and work with the businesses as opposed to kind of sitting behind this veil and the rate being set for you and the, the amount of jobs you take being set for you, where here you, you get more so a choice or a say so and what, how involved you want to get and what rate is being provided. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's your choice and we allow both options. And it's kind of interesting to see. Some people we, we just talk to and we're like, okay, this person is probably going to be a person that's going to do pickup and delivery only. They're mm. not going to launder the wash and fold. But then, you know, a month later, this person is at the laundromat doing wash and fold because they said, hey, for me, this makes more sense. I'd rather be at the laundromat than on the road driving from A to B, picking up and dropping off and kind of focusing on, the, on that side of the business. I'd rather be at the laundromat, just kind of I can focus. I can do my wash and fold um, and I can kind of focus on my customers the way I want to. Um, and you have different people who are completely opposite. At that point, we already kind of looked at it, how it might differ from other apps. But I guess when we look at other uh, services that are available, like Sudsy and Fly Cleaner, and even things similar to it, like TaskRabbit, you know, once more, it's just that you have a lot more flexibility afforded to you as far as how deep and how involved you want to get with Aloha, you know, as opposed to some of these other apps where it's a set rate maybe set amount of um, how cents per item or per pound. I think a lot of these apps or for the laundry in particular use like the weight of the clothes or you mm -hmm. get like a set bag and it determines. So is that also somewhat some degree how Aloha works as well? We kind of give recommendations and say, hey, this is how you should do pricing. This is the service you offer. But mm -hmm. end of the day, it's, it's your business. It's your opportunity how to kind of run it. So we allow our market developers to do their own pricing. Uh, we give them guidelines, kind of recommendations on how to do that. But ultimately, this is your opportunity to kind of say, hey, this is what my market wants. Because what you can do in San Diego versus what you do in New York, pricing-wise, mm -hmm. it's a whole different ballgame. Right? And just even return and turnaround times a whole different dynamic. right? Yeah. So that's why we kind of built our, our platforms to be 100% customizable by location. And we even go down to like, in for example, New York City, we go by borough. We can say different uh, pricing by borough and do it by location. And then you as the operator, you might have different needs and different expectations of yourself. You mm -hmm. know, you might be somebody who has a nine to five and you're doing this as a side and business. So you might price yourself 
little bit differently than somebody who's saying, hey, I want to develop this as a full time gig. And I want to kind of run away with this. You know, so you're going to do a little bit of different pricing and um, your turnaround time is a little different. That. So uh, let's talk about the operator as aspect as well, then. So I'm a laundry mat owner and I see, yeah, I like to add, you know, this delivery service to my business as a value add. Maybe I do have watch and fold here already. I'm able as an operator to then sign up to the app and then get access to a fleet. Is that how it works? Yeah. So you as a laundromat um, basically get access to our market developers who can do wash and fold at your facility mm. uh, or just give you more business as far as just delivering laundry to you and let you do the wash and fold as a laundromat owner. Most of the times if you're a laundromat owner, you're either involved in the pickup and delivery process yourself because you don't have enough drivers or the drivers that you do have get sick or decide to call off work or whatever that might be. Absolutely. Right. And then the other thing is if you do have wash and fold, but you don't have pickup and delivery to onboard a pick and pickup and delivery uh, system, just as, as far as like a POS system or like just the logistics of mapping that out. Mm -hmm. That's a whole nother job by itself. Absolutely. Right. And then on top of that, like you need to say, okay, I'm going to add pickup and delivery. Now, how do I actually market that? And how do I get the customers to kind of show that, show them that this is how we do things. Mm. That whole operation just takes time and a lot of energy. And most laundromat owners just don't have the extra time or resources to do that. Or um, the expertise. Yeah. Exactly. And then third layer is just, you need the, you need a vehicle. So you got to pay for the vehicle. You got to pay for the insurance, insurance on the vehicle. You know, it gets crazy pretty quick. So I don't know the big part of it is the marketing piece. Um, so does the onus of marketing at some extent go on the operator or is that something that Aloha Laundry also handles? Different people have kind of different skill sets, but we cover marketing for the most part. We do gotcha. national marketing where we do um, you know, Facebook and social media where we just kind of blast everywhere to do pick up a delivery. Um, and then we do like Google ads and, and so forth. And we have kind of our, our national website. But then we also kind of go to the local level. We do targeted marketing just for each location. We have an active market developer. Um, but for those market developers who say, hey, I have an active for marketing. I actually want to be involved in this process. We give them templates and strategies so they actually also can be a part of the, the marketing plan. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. All right. So that's good to know as well because, yeah, as you mentioned, you know, a lot of these operators may not have the expertise or know how to get started in that because i mean for the most part a lot of laundry businesses are family owned passed down to the next generation and it's it's just operates on its own there's never really been a need for marketing people will seek out these laundry mats when you have something like this value add service where you want to generate more revenue via you know use of the app and the rides and the market developers you know you want to get more money per transaction yeah, you're going to need a marketing tool to make that happen. So it's good to know that there is um, some guidance or some tools provided, you know, via Aloha, as opposed to just trying to figure it out all on your own. Yeah. All right. So let's get into some real talk. And I, before we get into that, uh -oh. though, how do people get like what if how do they get involved? Let's say they heard this and now they want to sign up or get more information. You know, where should they go? What's the process? Yeah, simply go to alohalaundrylife.com. Um, and then at the very bottom of the website or the top right corner, you can say join now or become a market developer. Literally click that button and then it takes you to um, our signup process. One of our team members will reach out to you, kind of show you the platform, show you all the different features, what it's like to be a market developer. Um, and then we'll give you access to Laundry University so you can start the education process. And then from there, we'll literally handhold you through what you need to do to become a market developer. That, that, and state licensees is the same thing as well. Or yeah, licensees. for state licensees, uh, go to aloha laundry life biz instead of dot com. Gotcha. Uh, but if you do end up on dot com, go to the bar bottom and just click partner with us, and that takes you to the same place. That, that, and then for the operators, they could go to the website as well, or is there another site for them? Yeah, same thing for laundromats, go to laundromat network on the websites, and everything you need is there as well. That, that. And let's say I want to get an example of what how Aloha works, or maybe I'm someone that just wants to use the service. Where is Aloha currently established or, you know, looking to expand? Yeah, so that's kind of the good news. Um, we have operations in Austin, Texas, um, Birmingham, Washington, mm. Virginia Beach, uh, Queens, New York, 
and then uh, Mesa, Arizona Queens. is. Yep, Queens is live now. Okay, um, Queens. Yep, yeah. you can get proper wash and fold done quick in yeah. Queens now. Um, and then Mesa, Arizona is officially live this week. Uh, basically last week, but I'll say this week. And then um, San Diego is soon to be live, and Vegas is soon to be live. So those two locations are uh, what we're working on these next couple of weeks. And then Orlando is and Chicago are like our two other places that we're kind of in the process of getting up and running. Okay. Okay. So you're hitting a lot of the major hub cities. I see. I see. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I think like even Texas alone is seeing like 20% is of, of the people that live there are part of the gig economy. So it's just like you're hitting the areas where it's, you know, popular and the people are, it's definitely turning to it. And that's a part of this real talk we're going to get into. And I kind of like the first thing I want to ask you now that you're in the space, you're doing it, you're, you own it, you know, our gig and share economies really or truly revolutionizing the way like Americans, for example, earn money. I think so. Uh, and the reason that is, is I think the traditional, well, I would say traditional, I mean, if you go back 60 years, this wasn't traditional, right? Mm. Um, you know, over the last 50 or 60 years, you know, plus or minus, we've basically been told, go work for a company, that company will take care of you, right? And yeah. I, that's not the case anymore. You know, most people, even when they work for a company, they jump from company to company every three years. Yeah. Uh, so that company is not going to take care of you. So for well, those individuals who want to take the ownership of their future and their potential income into their own hands, why not apply it to a skill set that you think you could be good at, you know? Exactly. And then when you start having that conversation of like, you know, the legacy conversation, the conversation of like, I want to build something that actually has meaning. I want to have a relationship with my customers that's beyond, you know, a phone call and getting them to, to close on a sale. Um, if you kind of start getting into those kind of topics, it's, it's entrepreneurship, it's a building a business. Um, and through the gig environment or the gig economy, you can create businesses that are sustainable that you can actually grow, but you don't have to work for somebody to, to do that. You know, you can create your own small little gig, whatever your skill set is. It could be laundry. It could be um, a number of things. It could be pest control, whatever that is. Um, you know, if you're willing to dive into that and really start thinking long term, um, you can shift your mindset. Definitely. And I think there was like a stat out there on like Velocity Global that said somewhere along the lines that about, you know, a lot of the main reason why probably half, 49% of the gig workers, you know, establish that being able to set your own hours is probably one of the most important factors when it comes to it and you know right now the united states leads the global market and you know the gig economies with other you know populous countries coming up on the rise as well but i guess as we look at the rise of gigs and yeah i guess the idea of freelancing and i know what a lot of people are doing is using their gigs to supplement their full-time income as well so they may work like a nine to five and then, you know, do a couple of rides on Uber or do a task rabbit or do a lift. And, you know, afterwards, like even a lot of the, the Uber drivers, shout out to the Uber drivers as well, because they are probably some of the friendliest that I've ever met. You know what I mean? Like there's always a conversation with Uber for some reason, especially like in Las Vegas or New York is a whole nother beast, <laughs> but um, always conversation. But apart from that, like, at some point, are gigs technically making Americans probably some of the most overworked as well, like work more? Are we being conditioned to work more? Or is it more so like a journey for self enterprise? Like, cause, you know, at the end of the day, no one's holding a gun to her head and saying, hey, you got to do this gig. But as we look at, you know, things like the market inflation, the cost of goods, adding a gig is probably something that's really pushing people forward and allowing them to afford their basic necessities and get that disposable income or maybe even, you know, main income that they need to pay their bills. But I mean, at the same time, is there somewhat a dark side to this as well? Do you think? Um, I'm not sure if there's a dark side. I, I think the way I look at it is the mindset of, or just the thoughts of overpaid over, or underpaid overworked kind of has the conversation that somebody owns your time and they're telling you what to do and what to work mm. um, or you know how much you can 
make or etc but when you're and I, one of the reasons i actually don't like the word gig worker anymore yeah. is it's kind of saying like it's a it's almost frivolous or it's a hobby or it's kind of like a, a side project where really and especially for aloha laundry life like market developers we're creating micro businesses it's kind of um something that we really is more tangible because yeah it's a small business but kind of a, a granular level um and you know the difference between a gig worker or somebody who owns a business is somebody who's building something is developing something it's growing something um and you're getting better at that right when you're a gig worker per se if you're just an uber driver you know your growth potential is what you're gonna memorize every street and you're gonna be super efficient with your <laughs> uber app you know uh, whereas on our side for laundry i mean shout out to uber drivers in different cities i don't know how they figure out how to get from one place to another google maps does something but they they know how to get there 10 times faster than uber yeah. so or uh the uber app uh but for us you know and the, one of the reasons we've invested heavily into laundry universities you got to get better you got to learn how to do laundry better more profitably how to serve your customers better because if, if you can't there's somebody, somebody else who's going to do it better than you and they're going to join our app and start making money and next thing you know you're going to be going back to being a gig worker absolutely absolutely and that's a good way to make the contrast there as well you know as a part like you're not you know putting this as a side hustle this could potentially be something that you develop as a full-out career or maybe if you're looking to get into buying the laundry business that runs your block, you could get started with Aloha or even expand with Aloha as a start. So you get a feel for what the business requires and calls for and get to know the people involved in it as well. Because, you know, as we all know, I think relationships is probably one of the key things that help kind of foster these business, you know, aspects. And that's something that's not really taught, you know, the relationship side of running a business and getting a more importantly that ground level experience with running it because you know, i could speak as a salary person you know you're capped at a certain point as far as how much you can learn and what you can do you know you're lucky if your employer is willing to give you tuition reimbursement if they want to expand your skill set so it's kind of like you don't control the fate of your own employment or basically like your own means of living and it's a scary thought to think that okay at any moment I could lose my job, I lose my security, you know, I lose my well-being, and I have to make this sudden adjustment, you know what I mean? And honestly, 401k is not enough, you know, retirement, you're going to get taxed to hell, and it's just like, whatever nest egg you think you're sitting on usually is not enough. And, you know, the way this sounds um, is that I would give it the, the aspect that as far as a gig, it has that ease of entry, um, is what it sounds like. So it's, you know, anyone at any level can get in as long as they're willing to learn. It really does sound like so yeah, for sure. That's and that's awesome. Yeah. So I mean, if you even take it to a, a step back for a second, um, mm -hmm. if you even like, let's say you go to a laundromat today, most laundromats that you go into today, there's actually somebody already there doing what we're doing, but they don't have an app or they don't have a platform. They're doing it over the phone, over text message or et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, New York City. Go to any laundromat challenge. There's going to be somebody there picking up laundry for somebody else, doing the wash and fold and hustling to do this business. Exactly. Right. What we said is you're already doing, and there's a lot of people who already figured this out to a certain level, but we just put a lot of technology behind there, made it easy. We put education behind you as well. And then we made this so that anybody could do it in a simple way and then convert that and say, you don't have to just rely on this as like a side income anymore. You can actually build something so like kind of you were saying, if you if you eventually want to own a laundromat, guess what? You've at least got six months or a year of experience. You know what the laundry industry looks like and you can make a decision if you want to buy a laundromat. Um, really inspirational person. Um, her name is slipping in my memory right now, but she's out of uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay. She's been doing this for like two years and she's just been hustling, just kind of like running a a virtual laundromat where she actually goes to random laundromats and does their laundry there. Wow. And she has like three employees that she has working for her. She has a proper like payroll system, et cetera. And these people already exist, but why not make it so that anybody can do it? And you don't have to kind of go to like the, the major roadblocks of like, Hey, how do I pay my employees or how do I pay my driver or 
How do I get an app so that my customers can place an order? How do I figure out what pricing is? How do I learn how to do laundry? Um, our platform allows you to do all that stuff in one gotcha. place, in one home. All right, that's what's up. That sounds yeah. good. So I guess let's tap into, now you actually own this endeavor. And can we talk a little bit about what's needed to really get into the space? Like quiet or somebody may be sitting on that next idea that's waiting to be turned into, a, you know, the next gig or the next freelance or ride to your opportunity. Give us an idea of like, what are some of the pros of cons of like entering this space? Yeah. So I don't know if there's any cons, but I'll give you a lot of pros. <laughs> um, maybe some cautionary tales. The biggest thing is you, when you get something that you think is viable and you can do it yourself, mm. right? Let's say it, it could be anything as simple as doing laundry or even creating a podcast or running a small business that in a small niche, if you can do it, right? Your first thought should be, can anybody else do it? Mm. And don't look at, in my opinion, don't look at it as, well, if anybody else can do it, then I shouldn't do it. Well, guess what? That means you need to get better. And then once you do get really good at that, you can teach other people to do it so that it's not just in your location. You can have it all over the country, all over the world, because most of the times, whatever you thought about or whatever you're trying to provide a service for, a lot of people want that across the country or across the world. And why not share your knowledge, your expertise? Um, and with technology nowadays, I mean, for example, like Laundry University, we created that. It took us six months or so. But guess what? Now we can give that to anybody in the whole world or in the whole country and teach people how to do laundry. It doesn't cost us anything. Every single time we add somebody, it doesn't cost us anything. But it took us the time, which, you know, our a laundry coach or um, education coordinator, Colleen, she has like 10 years of laundry experience. Just imagine 10 years of experience. If she had not created this platform, we just yeah. live in her laundromat right in Birmingham, Washington, little corner part of Washington. Mm -hmm. But now we basically said, let's share your knowledge and all your expertise and all those documents that you created, all those videos that you create from your little laundromat, your little five or 10 employees. Now we gave it to access to 500 people across the country. Gotcha. You know? gotcha. So I, I would just challenge people like, I'm sure, you know, people who listen to this uh, podcast have ideas or have expertise or, you know, some skill set that I could do or you could do, but they haven't taken the time to kind of develop education or figure out how to document this so that they can share with more people. Gotcha. So once like you determine the viability of whatever it is you're trying to do, or, you know, the, the idea, if you can do it, there's a possibility that other people can. So that's not really a con. I know when most people start a business, they want to look at what everyone else is not doing. And so when it comes to this particular industry, you want to look at something that, you know, can a lot of people do it. And in return, that's going to, you know, develop your fleet and, you know, allow you to serve as many businesses and make as serve as many consumers as possible. So I guess, can we talk about like what it probably costs to start a business like this? I mean, if you're doing your soap shop or your candle shop, minimal costs at best, minimal returns at best. <laughs> Uh, but at the same time, when you look at something like this, can you give us an idea, even like a range of like, okay, what are some of the costs involved, if not monetary, maybe even like experience or sweat equity or things like that, that you learn on the fly, or you may have to consider um, before you really jump in and before you get that idea, you got the idea now, you know, what kind of skills or costs am I looking at to really make it viable? Yeah, I think I can give you a quick example. So like the, the detergent that we offer for our market developers to use for customers, mm. this lady out of Tennessee, she said, hey, my clothes that my my mother gave me, I'm taking them to the dry cleaners, to the, to the laundromat, and they're not lasting as long anymore. They're magically getting ruined. But my mom had these for like 30 years. So yeah. why are, am I ruining these clothes? So these are I mean, your, your listeners who may be like soap makers or, you know, whatever candle makers, if you're actually willing to like invest the time and like create the new best soap or candle, you could potentially go super huge, you yeah. know? So what she did is she say, she actually boiled it down, hired some chemists, went to like uh, patents and like developed the process properly. Right mm -hmm. now she's selling her detergents all over the, the country to all over laundromats all over the place. Right. So what I would say from just, you know, our experience, um, especially from a technology company, 
is you have to figure out how to get your small location as prove it out as much as possible. But once you have an, like just the MVP version as it works, don't stop yourself from growing. Like don't be like, okay, I got to make this perfect. I have to figure out all the little tweaks of this until nobody complains about it. I got to make sure I feel 100% like this is the best idea in the world. You're not going to get there. So you don't waste your time, you know, spend years of perfecting something that you yourself probably can't get to perfection. So let it grow, have more people join your platform, get more feedback. And then before you know it, you know, you might spend 20, 30 grand to kind of get the app up and running and the, uh, the operations and the, the education, et cetera. But that 20 grand is going to be nothing compared to the kind of the revenue stream that you can potentially get generate. Gotcha. Gotcha. So yeah, it's like, you kind of like the idea that, you know, you can fear failure, but if you never get started, there'll never be anything to improve on. So it's like, unless you get started, you can't really grow. You can't really figure out what's going to work and what's not going to work. So yeah, that's definitely, you know, one way to look at it as well. But are there like any particular set of skills you feel are necessary to really make the next Uber or Lyft or Aloha? Like, are there any set of particular skills you think are absolutely vital or even characteristics if we were to boil it down from an individual level um because we may have like a variety of different educational backgrounds and whatnot that are listening um are there like any core skills you think are necessary to really make it yeah i think one big one that just kind of comes off is like know that you're going to be wrong a lot mm. you're going to make mistakes you're going to think the customer wants this or the platform should be a certain way and you're going to be hundred percent wrong. So pivot, change, upgrade, educate yourself and say, okay, I made a mistake. Let's move. Like, don't use that as like, okay, maybe it's not a good business plan anymore, a good business model. Well, you just made a mistake. There's, there could be a thousand different ways to do this. You happen to pick the, the first hundred that are just wrong. So just keep willing to like work at it and figure out when you, you do find something that, that does work. Um, another characteristic is like, you have to be willing to work with people. Like if you have the mentality, like I can do this and only I can do this, you're going to be struggling for a while. Mm. Um, but on the other side of that also have that kind of mentality where you can say, I can work on this for two weeks and nothing goes right, but I'm still going to work on it for two weeks, you know? Uh, so those are kind of a couple of things I've learned just kind of the last two years working on this. Um, yeah. but Ultimately, you're going to figure out that whatever problem you're trying to solve is probably going to be solved at the, like, the moment that you don't expect to be solved, right? Yeah. You're going to come at a problem. You're going to have all these resources. You're going to have all these preconceptions of like, hey, this is how I'm going to do this. And then the solution is going to come out, a random conversation, or you're going to figure out when, you know, two o'clock in the morning when you're working on something else, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think one of the key things you definitely touched on there was, getting that team and essentially surrounding yourself with those people, sometimes even that expertise that can help push that idea to the next level and also keep you accountable and keep you on track as well. Because with this, essentially you're providing a, an avenue for people to seek gainful employment and with the Aloha model, begin their own enterprises. So, you know, in return, that's a really big, you know, step and a really big on taking in, into this into this realm and it's really what i see is like making a transition you know as far as just adding another job to your repertoire and another way of making money it's like no you're actually trying to being taught how to make a business and retain a business and you know figure out the the aspects that make it work and yeah the way that sounds it can definitely be for those that are willing to put that you know sweat equity in and the elbow grease and it can definitely turn out to something more and expand upon it so let's talk about your own personal challenges with this business model or with this industry like can you share like one extreme challenge or the biggest challenge that you experienced with this so far oh just one um <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let me think that the biggest challenge or you could you could lump some of them all like, if you like. <laughs> um so let me maybe share one that's kind of like front of mind is um, 
I know with COVID and just kind of everybody trying to do Zoom calls and trying to do business across, you know, this interface here, um, yeah. sometimes not enough. And I, I think some of that was a challenge for me because I just expected everybody to get everything I was saying from a, a Zoom call. Yeah. And uh, sometimes I have a little bit of frustration to like, how come you're not understanding what I'm saying to you? Like, <laughs> this is pretty simple. Um, so I've actually learned that sometimes just being in the, in the same space with somebody, having a face-to-face -face conversation, showing them something, sometimes it's just 10 times better, you know? Um, so that's been kind of a, a huge learning curve for me. Um, the other just major obstacle um, and a lot of developers or like project managers kind of agree with this, like if you have some developers in different countries, like just learning the culture gaps and like figuring out how to work with yes. people from different countries, um, it's not bad. It's not terrible. It's just you got to learn how to orientate your conversations, how to say things differently, how to get work done in a different manner, what your expectations are versus their expectations could be completely different. So mm -hmm. you got to figure out how that, that is and don't be upset. Just kind of work around it. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, and then, uh, I think the last one is just, uh, and maybe kind of goes to the previous conversations, like knowing um, you're going to have problems with business partners or potential people that you're going to work with. But like being able to say the vision is bigger than this little problem that we have. So like moving past that. You know, definitely I can see this industry is not for the faint of heart. Like if you're looking to own, you know, an enterprise in this where you're serving people, and then giving people opportunities, definitely not for the faint of heart. Um, and you have to be willing to learn as you grow on with the model. Like there's like, it seems like there's going to be challenges. There's going to be hurdles, hills and gaps that you have to overcome. And especially if you don't, if you're looking to make an app in, per se, and you don't have a tech background, you know, you may be hiring that expertise and, you know, a, probably a good portion of that money, you know, that you need that seed money you're probably what you need to get that app started and running and also maintaining that over time as well um, is something to look at. But definitely understand why the people that do it, do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And knowing that, you know, if you're in this, you have to be in it and willing to ride it through. And, and you know, that, that makes sense as to why there aren't as many apps, you know, out there in the market now, as opposed to some of these business ideas that we aforementioned business ideas where there's just way too many. And, you know, with the ones that do develop, you know, if they're not tried or true, that proof of concept is not there. You understand why they're no longer in existence because <laughs> yeah. uh, they can be a cost to run as well. So let's look at before we get into Will It Gig, where I'm going to give you some of my own handcrafted gig ideas and you let me know if they are viable or not. But um, what can we expect from Aloha Laundry within the next couple of years or next couple of months even? Yeah, so let's go big picture and then short term. Uh, yeah. In a couple of years, uh, we should be basically in every major city in the country. Um, so we'll have an operator, a laundromat, um, hopefully a master licensee who can start making passive income from those locations. But um, ultimately, our goal within like two, three years is to have um, our market developers have a viable business they can actually start growing and developing um, and have all the resources they, they need to be successful. Uh, we want to train people to be good business operators, how to manage their, their budget and kind of control their, their cost, how to figure out what to do with marketing when, you, when you're trying to grow and expand. Um, so all those things that you just think are just normal, like MBA courses or business courses, a lot of the you know, the people who we might have joining our platform may not have went to business school or came from a different industry. So we want to kind of give them that business acumen to be successful because ultimately, yes, we want to keep them as, you know, market developers, but they might end up going to own their own laundromat or go to another business. And we think we can prepare them to whatever they, their passions are or ambitions are. And mm. so that's kind of where our kind of sole focus is. But um, in the meantime, until we get there, um, we want to deliver as much laundry as possible. It's kind of our goal over the next six months to a, a, a year. Um, and that really just means like mul opening multiple locations. So I kind of described like we're opening like basically two or three locations each month. Um, so the next six months or so, 
you know, hopefully we have another four or five locations live and operational and wherever people might search Aloha Laundry or like laundromat near me or pickup delivery near me, hopefully we show up. That, that is what's up. And that sounds like a good long-term and short-term plan. You know, I'll definitely be tuning in, recapping and giving everyone the updates as things progress as well. But if they're interested in following is also, you know, can you just share once more ways for them to reach out, follow, um, get the latest, you know, information, Facebook, Instagram, whatever it may be. Yeah, so definitely go to our website, alohalaundrylife.com. Uh, but if you want to follow us on Instagram or Facebook, just do Aloha Laundry app. And that's everything that you need there. Um, if you want to be a market developer, if you want to be um, a customer, um, that's all of there and then if you are interested in the licensing portion again just go to aloha laundry life dot biz or go to dot com and go to the bottom and just partner with us um we're open to questions we're open to dialogue so if you say hey i want to open my own laundromat or i just want to be a mass licensee ask us and we're gonna figure it out together bet bet that's what's up all right so y'all heard it we'll also drop it in the description of this episode so yeah have no excuses it was said and it was written so there's definitely more ways. Save the post when this episode drops so you have that information if you ever want to come back to it. And all right, we're getting down to my second favorite part of this discussion, and that is called Will It Gig? And I intentionally hid these from you so you would not know what these opportunities are. So basically, I'm going to share with you three I think are somewhat viable, you know, gig opportunities or entries into the space and you just tell me will it gig or not all right okay. first one shankly someone's got you cranking but we'll get to shanking latest entry to the gig space connecting you with seasoned shivs shankers cutthroats knee busters ops and real certified hood mother efforts that just don't give a f and will twist a fool's muffin cap back you feel me shankly will it gig or not um, I feel like there's a TV show that came up with this idea as well. <laughs> um, I think it's like some girls who like to say, Hey, if I need somebody corrected and you show up and do it. Um, so I, I'm going to say yes. It will um, gig. I think so. I don't see why not, uh, except for the potential consequences of the actions, I guess. <laughs> So from All a right. technology standpoint and a customer demand standpoint, I, I think it's definitely viable. It might work. It might work. All right. That's, that's good. All right. Next one. Wipe clean. Let skid marks and ass cross be a thing of the past when you use wipe clean. Newest service connecting you with certified wipers. Get that clean bottom you deserve without the mess and stress of wiping your own ass. Wipe clean. Will it gig or not? And I think this already exists, right? You have the, <laughs> What's the or whatever they come. Or yeah. Craigslist. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna say no, just because maybe it's come up with a new name, but just overall potential. Can I put like in between? Is that is that a, <laughs> a possible, a possible? All possible. right. Yeah. And my next one. So that was, was a, a possible. So Shankly, yes, quite clean, possible. And my favorite one probably here is Trap B and B. A dynamic entry in the hospitality share sector intertwining the experience and daily nuances of living and scoring a trap house with a traditional bed and breakfast feel. Where else can you capture the feel of living out the real trap experience balanced with the civility of home? Trap being B. Will it gig or not? Um, so I'm going to say no as a gig. <laughs> But as an experience, I, I think you could do it again. <laughs> no, so this actually reminds me, I did an internship back in, when I was like 19 or 20 years old. And they had like a, basically you could be what would be like a normal homeless person experience for like yeah. 48 hours. And you can like literally be, and they like put you into like a simulation and you mm -hmm. actually do like a homeless experience for like, Again, 48 hours, and they treat you badly and they like shun you and like all the things that you know real <laughs> homeless people experience. So I, yeah. I this seems like similar. 
<laughs> that sounds like a me too movement for the homeless people in yeah. waiting right there. But with this one, you could be Scarface potentially, or, you know, the guy with the 50 bag on the corner and you get a feel for, you know, what it's like and, you know, bullet riddled homes and, you know, chicken shack for breakfast, who knows, but yeah. Trap B and B, you know, it's something. You know, I think the hood needs a little a love too in the B and B space. You know what I mean? You know, give some struggling really? actors some, you know, some some paper. This is Westworld, the TV, show, <laughs> right? This is basically what the whole thing is about. Yeah, basically, you can do whatever you want, and just but it's a simulation. But you're saying do it for real. All right, well, then I see where your mind is, man. <laughs> I'm trying to help them out. You know, I'm trying to help them out. We got a lot of different, you know, demographics that listen. You know, they yeah. never know. Proof of concept. But that's Actually, what my... Amazon has that now. Yeah, Amazon yeah. has virtual experiences where you can go to, like, Costa Rica, but just be at your house. And Good, somebody nice. would literally walk around with a camera and just show you the birds <laughs> or whatever. So you could be a tra- in a trap house, but just from a VR system or something, you know? Hey, the safety of your own home. See, this is what happens when you get minds in the room. Things happen. For sure. <laughs> but Daniel, yo, trust. It was a pleasure. Always love linking up with you, man. The next time you're in the city, we'll grab some injera or something, some honey wine. You know what I mean? Do some toasting. But um, other than that, any last words for the folks you'd like to drop before we depart? No, oh, man, just great conversation. Thanks for the questions. Uh, and let's do it again sometime in the future, I guess. Sounds good. Y'all heard it from myself and the man Daniel Ellis with Aloha Laundry Life yourselves. Definitely check them out. Uh, Check out their website. Check them out on Instagram. We'll provide all that in the description as well. This is a bonus episode. So I'm sorry to disappoint y'all if y'all don't see our regular programming of Wednesday releases, but this is a bonus drop. Um, Stay tuned. More information, more entertainment is coming and it's on its way. And Daniel, pleasure as always. We'll be catching up. You know, and thanks again for coming on, brother. Likewise, man. Thanks for your time. All right. Stay blessed, y'all. Stay loved. If no one loves you, trust me, we do. All right. Peace. And that concludes today's episode. But that doesn't mean the conversation has to end. As a matter of fact, feel free to check us out at JJC Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter for our post-discussion question following the release of this episode. If you are a black or minority business owner or professional that would like to be featured on the Rep Yours segment of our show or a listener with some general feedback for the podcast panel, feel free to shoot us an email at jjcpod at gmail.com. As always, likes and comments are always appreciated. Be sure to subscribe or follow to be notified when the next episode releases. And until then, stay safe, stay blessed, peace.